This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting on over 900 stations, on Pacifica and NPR stations, on college and community stations, on public access TV and PBS TV stations, and both TV satellite networks, on Dish Network, Channel 9415 Free Speech TV, 9410 Link TV, and on Direct TV, Channel 375 and Channel 348. We're also podcasting at democracynow.org and an iTunes video and audio podcasting. Our headlines are available in Spanish for any ready institution to take, as over 300 are. I'm Amy Goodman with Sharif Abdul Kadus, and we're speaking for the hour with Dr. Atul Gawande, a surgeon at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, a staff writer at The New Yorker magazine, and associate professor at Harvard Medical School. His latest book, Out Today in Paperback, is called The Checklist Manifesto, How to Get Things Right. Well, the talk of death panels was revived in recent weeks after the Obama administration issued a regulation covering end-of-life planning in annual examinations. Before the White House ultimately said it would reverse the directive on Tuesday, a number of right-wing media pundits and politicians took aim, accusing the government of rationing care. This is a sampling of voices in recent weeks from the right-wing networks Fox News and Fox Business, with hosts Dana Perino, Andrew Napolitano and Tucker Carlson. Infamous death panels who are supposed to have died before the passage of the Democrats' health care bill? Looks like they're alive and kicking. The Democrats took end-of-life planning, what critics call death panels, out of the health care bill. But now they've been made part of a federal regulation. The old idea, if you can't legislate it, enforce it. Are the so-called death panels revived? After furious, hot debate months ago, the end-of-life planning that was in the health care bill was dropped. But could it be back? Without getting too much into the weeds and, and the how it would actually happen, can the Congress rescind this decision by Secretary uh, Sebelius to create these death panels? The federal bureaucrats and planners and the people who imagine they're in control of our, of our medicine are going to have to figure out ways to convince old people, the elderly and the mm -hmm. sick, to forego treatment and instead choose to shorten their yeah. lives. Those are some of the voices on Fox News and Fox Business talking about uh, death panels, reviving the specter of so-called death panels. Uh, what's your response to this kind of uh, language in the media? This is a travesty. This is about a health care problem for millions of Americans who all face, at some point in their course of their life, terminal illness. We have now an immense number of studies showing that discussions with doctors are beneficial, they are too short, uh, and being able to have time to have real careful discussion about what people's goals, fears, and concerns are as they face the prospect that treatment is no longer working is absolutely crucial. This is not about a discussion of whether you will get that $100,000 treatment versus not get that $100,000 treatment. I'm a cancer surgeon. We're going to give that to you. I give that to patients every day. When it reaches a point where we're actually doing more harm than good, we have been unwilling to have those discussions. And the idea that you can brand an entire set of policies around trying to make forward progress on these kinds of issues, take discussion off the table is harmful to people. Now, explain exactly what was cut out, these annual checkups that would include what kind of discussion? Yeah, the irony here is this is a tiny portion of what's needed to make care better for people. Um, at an annual, at your annual physical, the provision would have allowed for the physician to get extra payments to spend the extra time needed to discuss with you end-of-life issues. Um, it could be up to once a year. Uh, you can be ha perfectly healthy. You can be perfectly healthy and, and, and have a discussion um, about if uh, what your goals for a living will might be. Now, the truth of the matter is for uh, a primary care doctor sitting down with you for an annual physical, if you're a uh, if you're 40 years old and there's no issues going on, this is not going to be topic A. But when you are 40 years old but have an incurable lung cancer, um, uh, like my 35-year-old patient did, or you are uh, 78 years old and have a congestive heart failure and you're on oxygen at home, and, um, and it's a typical 20-minute visit, the... Uh, there are a number of barriers to why that discussion doesn't happen. One is that 
paying for the extra time that these discussions take. Emotions get opened up, and there's a need for uh, a, a really good professional to walk through these moments with you, and, and no one wants to face them. Uh, the cost barrier is one. It's a tiny one. The big barriers that also play into it are the fact that, that neither the doctor nor the patient are comfortable with these discussions, and, and, uh, and we're not good at them. Um, learning how to get good at them, getting that cost barrier out of the way, and making it simply part of our professional responsibility that we can help people just e even when we don't necessarily have great treatments for them. That's, cru that's crucial. Well, let's look at the bigger picture for a moment. So the Republicans are taking control of the House today, as we mentioned, and they've said they're, one of the top things on their agenda is to repeal the health care reform bill. You wrote after the bill was signed, uh, you made an analogy to what happened in 1965 when Johnson signed Medicare uh, into law. Explain what happened then and what the analogy is to now. Yeah, the week that the um, uh, health reform bill passed, uh, I wrote that um, we should be prepared for the war to come. We remember Medicare passing in 1965 as this historic accomplishment that then went smoothly into uh, becoming a health care program for everybody over 65 um, uh, without any uh, troubles along the way. But in fact, it was severely under attack from the moment it passed. Uh, 10,000 physicians in the Ohio State Medical Association uh, announced they would boycott any elderly patients who had come to them who had Medicare. And then you had the requirement that now that this was a federal program, that hospitals in the South um, would have to be integrated in order to get paid under Medicare. And so 50 percent of the hospitals in the South were uh, announcing they'd boycott, including George Wallace, the governor uh, of, uh, of Alabama, announcing that, um, that he would lead that, that boycott and repeal effort. Um, Johnson uh, did a combination over the next few months of both confrontation and conciliation. Um, the confrontation, he sent a thousand inspectors into the South and ensured that um, black patients could be admitted to the doors of white hospitals and even be in the same wards that white patients were on, which was considered impossible. He went so far as um, make, enforcing that blood could no longer be labeled white blood versus black blood. Um, this was thought to be the kind of thing that would put people into the streets. It was not popular, but he pushed because it was the right thing to do. Um, and by the time the law actually, uh, one year later, the card started landing in people's mail f to get their Medicare coverage, 90 percent of the hospitals in the South had signed up. With the doctors, on the other hand, he compromised. Uh, about nine months after the bill passed, there was a series of improving amendments um, that represented some compromises that, you know, not everybody was happy with. Some of them actually did improve the program, but they made sure that passage could go in. And ultimately, we're in that beginning phase. We are in that you know, the battle of uh, trying to see that nothing happens. But stalemate is a disaster here uh, for the healthcare system. We have to have ways to move forward, and, um, and finding ways through this is going to be an immense uh, a test of presidential leadership. And the argument, aside from integrating the hospitals, like of the Ohio um, establishment, why were they opposed to Medicare? Simply because government was spending money on health care for older people? Uh, the, the rhetoric is markedly familiar. It's government takeover. It is socialism. It is um, uh, it's going to be uh, harming people. Um, your grandmother will not get the treatment that she needs. Um, the the what's it's fascinating. The the entire basis of argument is not strikingly different. And here, this is a bill that's not even bringing in a government insurance program. This is a bill that's providing subsidies to private insurers to make it possible for 32 million people uh, to receive insurance who didn't have it. Um, plus, start putting in some. Um, uh, billions of dollars for uh, experiments in communities across the country in improving quality of care while trying to lower the costs of care. Um, the uh, that's the you know the meaning of this kind of legislation is um, uh, something that's that is under um, this is the core source of debate people trying to determine what it means to put such a complex package together. Medicare was not exactly simple as a program 
either, and uh, and this is an effort to define it, even you know by repeating the words death panel over and over and over again. Well, I mean, you bring up an in interesting point. There, there are critics of the bill from across the political spectrum. You know, many thought that this just expanded an already broken system, that it forced people to buy a faulty product, health insurance, that it didn't include a, a public option, which many said was essential to real reform. What's in the bill that you like? Why do you think it's a good piece of legislation? You're absolutely right. There are, there are concerns from both the left and the right. And um, what is essential is that we are an experimenting and innovating society, that we are trying new things when we face problems and break down. We reached we were able to reach an agreement that that um, could get a uh, get through Congress when people have tried for half a century to get passage of coverage for the uninsured and for improving the delivery system for care. And uh, we have uh, finally accomplished it. It will represent now our next decade of work, seeing how well it works, seeing where the problems are. And if, for example, private insurers um, simply prove uh, uh, to worsen care, to only add on layers of cost, um, this is a test that the insurers have to end up measuring up to or failing. And if they fail, um, then it's every reason that the left will be correct, that the um, that government insurance programs are in fact better than private insurance programs. This is the test and the question that we can actually try out, or we just go into stalemate. One of the key provisions of the health care law targeted by Republicans bars insurance companies from denying coverage based on pre-existing conditions. Former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, who is considered one of the top contenders for the Republican presidential nomination in 2012, mocked the provision in a speech before the Value Voters Summit last September. And in a lot of this, it sounds so good, and it, it, it's such a warm uh, message to say, and we're not going to deny anyone from a pre-existing condition. Look, I, I, I think that sounds terrific, but I want to ask you something from a common sense perspective. Suppose we applied that principle that you can just come on with whatever condition you have and we're going to cover you at the same cost we're covering everybody else because we want to be fair. Okay, fine. Then let's do that with our property insurance. And you can call your insurance agent and say, uh, I'd like to buy some insurance from a house. He'd say, tell me about your house. Well, sir, it burned down yesterday, but I'd like to insure it today. And he'll say, I'm sorry, but we can't insure it after it's already burned. Well, no pre-existing conditions. How would you like to be able to call you the insurance agent for your car and say, I want you to insure my car? Well, tell me about your car. Well, it was a pretty nice vehicle until my 16-year-old boy wrecked it yesterday. Total the thing out, but I'd like to get it insured so we could get it replaced. Now, how much would a policy cost if it covered everything? about as much as it's going to cost for health care in this country. That was former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee, considered the top contender for the Republican presidential nomination 2012. Dr. Atul Gawande, your response? Well, the, what's fascinating is that it, the argument here is exactly the case for what for the individual mandate. That is, if you're going to have a private insurance system, um, the Republicans have attacked and want to strip out of the bill the, the thing that allows a private insurance system to survive if you're going to provide care and get rid of pre-existing conditions for people, which is that everybody would obtain private insurance coverage and, if they couldn't afford it, have subsidies for that insurance. If you, um, uh, yes, of course, if we had a system that said no uh, mandate for having to have insurance of some kind, then no one would have insurance and only would activate their insurance the minute that they got sick. Um, the, you know, I wish this were a matter of arguing about the um, the key detailed points back and forth. Um, but the core issue here is that, on the one hand, attack the provision that pre-existing conditions are, um, are, are there's a regulation, you'll call it bureaucracy and its regulation to uh, ban pre-existing conditions, and then uh, attack the bill for um, not uh, for uh, mandating that insurance be uh, required, uh, but then also attack the idea that you're going to, because uh, the only alter alternative to that would then be single payer. If you do not have the basic provisions in place for insurance regulation, then the only other option for insuring the public would be government. Uh, government